Welcome back everyone, this is Classic Homesteading Practices, and today we're going to be talking about rabbits. I can't believe it's already season three of this. We're going to be talking about more farm animals, and also, really quickly, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Facebook page set up uh, called Classic Homesteading Practices. It's for people who want questions answered on the podcast or on the Facebook page. I also wanted to make it so if anybody is interested in homesteading, we can start answering any questions that come up on there. So again, if you want to check that out, Classic Homesteading Practices is the name of the Facebook page. I really hope that you check it out so I can help you out with anything. Or just add something to the podcast that I've forgotten about. But anyway, let's get into rabbits. So these little fluff balls are probably the most versatile of animals. And I don't know if I've said that in any other podcast, but these guys are truly the most versatile and the most well-loved in the farming homesteading community. And the reason for this is because you can almost always have a rabbit in any home style. Unlike chickens, ducks, any kind of fowl or other farming animal, you really are able to keep rabbits in your home for the most part. I have never had a problem with landlords in a pet approved home say that rabbits can't live in the home. Uh, If you've had this issue, I would love to hear about it, because that would be crazy to me. But anyway, they're so compact, they can range from 6 pounds all the way to 20 pounds, depending if you get something small like a Polish or something as large as a Flemish giant. They are very well-mannered, they love people, and they are delicious. Now, if that concerned you, I would like to remind anybody who is new here, this is a homesteading channel. I am going to be talking about using rabbits as a food source, along with other means for these animals. So, buckle up or have a wonderful day. So, let's get started with infrastructure. How are you going to be able to house these animals. And for people who have them as pets, usually they have an area sequestered for their rabbit. There is a plastic or a metal cage that is used that is about three to four times the length of a rabbit and two rabbits wide. And it's a plastic bottom with a mesh metal top. I think most people have seen them inside of an animal store. If not, uh, basically it's just a big metal wire mesh cage. And what you would usually put in there for a house rabbit is a hay or pelleted bottom for the bunny to run across. You would have a food area, which is usually a little hay dispenser, and then you would have a little water bottle for your rabbit on the side. And the reason why I'm telling you about this is because that is actually a uh, steady stream line way of using cages in regular homesteading. I know a lot of homesteaders who use uh, cages as their main way of housing their does, their female rabbits, and their bucks, their male rabbits, when they're trying to have a meat source for their rabbits. And the reason why they do this is so that they can have a consistent way of understanding and monitoring a birthing cycle for their rabbits. Because of how quickly a rabbit is able to conceive and give birth, and how the doe rabbit is so very protective of her area. Most meat housing facilities for rabbits 
give a cage per rabbit. And again, they do this because rabbits are very territorial. This includes mothers. And when they go into birthing, they get very stressed out if any other rabbit is in their territory. So, and this also includes with pregnancy. They can fight, they can hurt each other, and if more than one rabbit is living in the same area uh, as another doe that has had bunnies, have kits, uh, they can and sometimes will eat the babies out of stress. So, if you're going to do the cage route, always make sure to do one doe per cage. I would recommend having the metal mesh be a one by two so it doesn't hurt the bunny's feet because having uh, rabbits having foot sores is a very big concern for rabbit health and can really put a damper on your rabbit's health and well-being. Another thing that can help your rabbit is also putting a wooden plate inside the rabbit cage for them to just stay on for most of the day um, and just get off the wire. But the biggest reasons why metal wire cages are used is because of their droppings. Being able to keep the cages cleaner by making a wire meshing uh, instead of a cage with a metal or a plastic or wooden bottom. The feces are able to just flow through the bottom. You can shovel them out from underneath the rabbit cages and then just slop them into your garden beds and use it as fertilizer, which is another great reason to have rabbits because it is a cold... Yeah, because rabbit poop is what is considered a cold fertilizer. You are able to take it right out of the rabbit and right into your garden, which is something you cannot do with cow, chicken, or pig poop. That has to rest because it is a hot fertilizer or it is nitrogen rich. You need to let it cure for about a year and then you're able to use it in your garden beds. So again, that's another reason why rabbits are really amazing because again, the versatility of them is so much larger than other animals. Gosh, but you know, chickens again are just pretty fantastic because they give you eggs and they give you fertilizer and they, they give you meat, so I mean, versatility ranging. No, I, I still think rabbits beat them just because you can't keep chickens inside your house, at least not in the United States. And they smell so much worse than rabbits do. But rabbit meat is still pretty good in comparison to chicken meat as well. But anyway, back to cages. So, biggest thing that you have to make sure you have is a large enough cage for them to get exercise in. So at least three to four si times the size of the rabbit in length and twice the size of the rabbit in width. And make sure that they have a stand to get off the cage itself. So a flat piece of wood or an area that has straw that they're just able to get their feet off the wiring. Make sure that they have a hay bin for either loose hay or grass pellets and then a water bottle or a drinking area for them to get water from. And that is the easiest way to keep a doe or a buck rabbit. Now the second way to do it is a hutch, which is just another fancy way of saying a chicken coop. It's an above ground area for your rabbits to live in. Again, the space is probably gonna be bigger. You usually put more than one rabbit in there and 
you usually have an exercising area for them to be in as well. So a fenced off place outside of the hutch. Now, for people who also do this, you may or may not want to put bird netting on there. I would always say do bird netting just so birds of prey can't get your rabbits. There may be a chance of feuding or fighting between your female rabbits um, if they do not have enough space to have their litters far enough away from each other. So you do need to take that into consideration. There is also the nice thing for your rabbits to have a more insulated area. So a better place for them to get out of the sun in really hot weather or stay warmer in really cold weather. And again, just a larger area for them to hop around or get exercise in. Again, rabbits are very social creatures. That's why they're so very easy to deal with with humans. You're able to grab them, work with them, poke and prod them if you spend the time with them. They are a communal creature. And usually there is multiple does to one buck in an area, in a community. And when you have a large enough space to house multiple does and a buck, there is a more likely healthy turnout for your colony. So if you decide to have a hutch, you will have a higher chance of uh, rabbits, of a fertile rabbit colony. But again, because of stress that could happen either from predators or lack of socialization with humans and rabbits, you could have the chance of mothers eating their young. So just make sure to be more aware of that. Try to familiarize your rabbits of you, uh, which is just being out there more than cleaning the pen. Uh, give them snacks. Make things more available for them. And uh, just make sure not to kick your rabbits. Understand that they are a burrowing animal, so they will try to burrow underneath the fence. Uh, an easy way to stop that is to put electrical fencing around the bottom part of the fencing. Or you can stick a plank on the inside and the outside of the fence area. And then the last one that you can do is a colony setting. Which means that you are giving your rabbits a plot of space, whether it is indoors or outdoors, for them to burrow in. And the reason why I say indoors is because even though it may be a concrete surface on the top, if you give them a padding of hay to burrow in, rabbits will do it. Rabbits will work with you on that. Um, but doing a colony setting is just a larger version of a hutch. It is a uh, more natural wild habitat. Uh, or the closest thing that you can do for a wild habitat for your rabbits and the most natural way to get your rabbits going in a setting that is very hands-off and free. So if you don't really want to be a part of your meat rabbits' uh, lives, doing a colony setting just keeps the natural process of breeding and making babies a lot easier for you. Uh, another reason why it's convenient is because you don't have to build them hutch areas. You don't have to build them resting areas. Now, it is a lot more convenient for them to have little places that they can scoot underneath, but because they are a burrowing animal, they will build their own burrows. I personally recommend uh, digging them places uh, People have done buckets halfway underground um, or boxes. They have made pre-built dens uh, and put wood slats over it. Just a place 
that has already been dug out for a rabbit to make their home and so they don't have to do the work. And also, you don't have to do the work later when you're checking to see how many bunnies are in the litter that your rabbit has uh, produced. So if you are one of those people who want to go out and count the litter, uh, I definitely suggest doing a bucket system, which is where you dig a hole in the ground, uh, which is half the height of a bucket that you've drilled a hole into the side or cut a hole into the side. You put hay on the bottom and then you close the lid on top and you dig a hole to the bucket and your rabbits will make a home in that bucket and they will furrow and they will give birth in that bucket and I would say for every female that you have have one bucket because again it is going to serve as their den and a buck is going to make his rounds. I usually say only do one buck per colony. The reason being is because, again, rabbits are very territorial. And there have been cases in most parts uh, of rabbits. They will uh, tear off the testicles of a rival male. I don't know how PC that is. I really hope that there are no children listening to this podcast with their parents. If so, you just learned some anatomy today. Um, But that is the nature of a highly territorial tiny animal. Um, It's quick. You find out who the, the top male is immediately afterwards. Uh, and he will be the one breeding with the girls. Uh, you will not have a backup buck in a communal setting or a colony setting unless you have a large area for your bucks and does. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do it. I just haven't seen a large success rate in a small area. Again, if you want to do... A colony setting, again, very hands-off. You only need to put food and water for them. And if it's in a grassy area with a natural uh, water source, you don't have to be hands-on in a colony setting at all. You just have to let them breed, and then you take care of the animal when it's time to uh, when it's time to process them. Now, this does make them harder to catch because, again, you are not a part of their lives. Uh, You will be running after them or you will have to make a way uh, to shoot them off into an area, a different area, so you are able to process them, uh, whether that is with an axe or a twenty-two rifle or any other means of dispatching a rabbit but it is a lot harder when you do not have a uh it's a lot harder to deal with when the rabbit is more wild instead of a domestic rabbit that you can just go up and touch and grab and hold and also you will be dealing with screaming Uh, when you dispatch a rabbit as well. So for anybody who's never uh, processed rabbits before, that is something that you're going to need to learn. Rabbits scream. It's not a cute scream. It is a bloody murder scream that will startle you the first time uh, that you dispatch a rabbit, especially if you do it improperly. Now there is a technique where you're able to uh, break the neck very quickly and safely. I cannot describe it properly on this channel just because I am not an expert in net breaking. But if you're looking for a humane way to take care of a rabbit to process them, I would definitely look up and Google uh, 
neck dispatching or dispatching with a 22 or again I wouldn't say doing it with an axe is the best way because unlike a chicken a rabbit will move and squirm around there's no way to stop a rabbit from moving unless you have a gallows-esque chop block for a rabbit but on the other hand again a neck break or a shotgun is going to be the easiest way for you to do it let's see we have talked about infrastructure and territorial behavior food and water dispatching let's talk about the actual rabbits themselves so there are hundreds of different types of rabbits and like i said earlier there are rabbits ranging in the six pound range all the way up to 20 pounds and for those of you who have never seen a flemish giant they are beautiful big babies and they are also very delicious rabbits to eat They are going to be the highest yielding when it comes to meat, but they also will be the largest bill carriers. So if you want to have a lower bill, uh, get a rabbit like a New Zealand white or a red or a red fur rabbit that are specifically grown and maintained as the fastest growing and fattest rabbits. They are made as the commercial uh, meat rabbit, basically. And it is a wonderful thing because of how quickly they do fatten up in comparison to other rabbits. Uh, Usually you will be dispatching them about six to eight weeks, unless you want to go to the full term of six months. But Usually, uh, at six months, you are going to start using them as breeding stock instead of meat. When you do have them at about six to eight weeks, uh, it is a little easier for you to process the animal because the skin is not fully formed uh, or it is easier to take the skin off of the animal. It is also easier to dispatch and uh, unhinge the joints from a younger rabbit than an older one. Let's see. Now, I definitely have to say, look online for videos of dispatching and processing rabbits. Do not just take my advice and go ahead and uh, take care of a rabbit your first go because It can go very wrong very quickly, but I would also say have somebody show you how to do it first. Don't try and do it on your own unless you have no other means of doing it. Then yes, definitely go ahead uh, and try, but if you do have somebody that is experienced in this, who has done it before, ask them for help. Don't feel bad about it or embarrassed because we've all been there. Everybody starts out at the beginning uh, as not knowing. But the best way to learn is by experiencing it. Um, back to rabbits. I know I keep going back to processing. that. It's because that's where my brain always goes to when it comes to rabbits, is the meat rabbit aspect. Even though there's so much more to rabbits. Like I was talking about earlier, if you have a rabbit that is called a lion's head rabbit, they are a type of fiber rabbit. I personally am a fiber spinner. I make yarn out of wools and silks and rabbit hair and camel fur and uh, for people who own lion heads or other fiber rabbits you know that you have to brush them every day 
and then when the fur is at the length that you have desired, then you shear the rabbit, you comb the fur, and then you spin it with a spindle or a spinning wheel. And rabbit fur is actually one of the few fibers that is actually a very expensive uh, fiber for its weight. Usually fiber is taken by the ounces and when it comes to a sheep's fiber versus a rabbit's fiber you could pay about $15 for five ounces of wool, lamb's wool, versus $15 for one ounce of rabbit's wool. And the reason being is because of how long it takes to harvest one ounce from a rabbit versus a sheep. And also, satin rabbits specifically are very soft in comparison to wool and are still more water resistant and also very warm. So, it is quite the delicacy to have a homespun rabbit garment of any kind, and you will find yourself to be staying very warm with one made, if you ever have one made for you. Another thing to keep in mind is that rabbits, again, are very quick to produce, so you might find yourself with an overload of rabbits. And another reason that that is totally fine is because they are easy to uh, get rid of in one way or another because people want them as pets. There is a humongous market for, again, meat rabbits. There is a humongous market for show rabbits. And if you do decide to do show rabbits, which I know many a person who's done it, the rabbit in question can go from $20 for a pet rabbit all the way to 50 to a hundred dollars per rabbit depending on the show quality so if you decide that you want to go into a business of rabbits you have many avenues to go down when it comes to homesteading i know people who do it for furs for show for spinning for meat and for fertilizer and every person who has talk to me about their business says that yes we started with two rabbits and then we just kept on going there have been people who decided that they just want the rabbit products for their farm but there is always a surplus amount and if they are negligible on keeping the breeding under check and that can be the case with a colony breeding there are always more rabbits than necessary. So my one big piece of advice of if you decide you have rabbits, just make sure that you are on top of their breeding. Uh, if you don't want breeding, definitely get them fixed. And yes, there are some people uh, who do show or do spinning that I would definitely say get them fixed unless in your area for show. Uh, you will need to keep your rabbit intact, but it leaves the animal to be less stressed, uh, less territorial, and in some cases and studies it has shown that fixing your rabbit will actually give your rabbit a longer and healthier life. So, there are many different things to think about when you are having a rabbit or a rabbit colony or just a couple in your backyard that are just having a good time. Again, these are sweet animals. They are very affectionate and loving and communal animals. Make sure to have more than one because if you don't, you are just doing a disservice to your rabbit. Mainly because you are going to be their only source of entertainment if it is a pet or a show, or a spinning uh, wool animal. Always make sure that they have things to do, whether it is gnawing, chewing, playing, or running around the house. And again, if it is only one animal 
or one rabbit, make sure that you have other animals in the house because they are able to make friends with cats, dogs, birds, any other animal. And they are a beautiful creature that can fill your life with warmth and affection. So, depending on what you want from this rabbit is dependent on how you treat them in the long run. If they are livestock, treat them as livestock. If you want them for anything else, treat them with love and respect. And if you want to raise them like wild animals, just remember, they'll, if you're not properly contained, they will get into anything and everything. All right. Thanks for listening to this today, guys. I hope you enjoyed Rabbits, an introduction by Classic Homesteading Practices, and I will talk to you next week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Bye.